So welcome everyone, bienvenue, konnichiwa, and hi tai, as we say in Okinawa. Thank you so, so much uh, for joining us. And thank you to the Science Summit at the UN General Assembly 77 for having us participate. And we also wish to thank uh, OIST, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, and the permanent mission of Japan to the United Nations for co-hosting this session. We appreciate all your support. So we have about 90 minutes together, so let's get started. My name is Heather Young. I'm the very, very proud Vice President of Communications and Public Relations at OIST. We are a top research and graduate university located in Okinawa, Japan. I won't tell you what time it is here right now. Uh, I am Canadian, in case you don't recognize or in case you do recognize uh, my accident, my accent. Uh, I first saw Betsy Reed um, in a webinar put on by ABC in the UK. Um, that's the International uh, Association of Business Communicators. It's our um, professional association. And it was early on in the pandemic when webinars had a bit more novelty. <laughs> um, I was immediately struck by Betsy's passion, her expertise, um, just how she presented communicating on social issues. I'm so thrilled that she's agreed to be here with us today. So Betsy, could you please introduce yourself? Right, taking myself off mute. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I was really honored, absolutely chuffed, as we say in the UK, to, to hear from you, Heather, after that webinar, as you mentioned, early on in the pandemic. I, think I looked back in my emails and my calendar, and it was November 2020. And oh, how much have we all lived since then, right? <laughs> we live in a very different world now, but we didn't know what was coming. So just to introduce myself very briefly, um, I have a lot of background in communications, but always focused on social and environmental issues. I started young, and you might have guessed my accent is also not British. So I was born and raised in Wyoming in the United States, which is kind of a unique element of my personal story and why I've always sort of felt like my path was to stand out and kind of be a disruptor. It's the least populated state in the US. And just for comparison, geographically, it's the size of the UK and has 500,000 people, half a million people. So there aren't a lot of people. It's a very wild place. And it's it's a sort of celebrated pioneer. My family's been there since, you know, before it was a state. And so I was always raised with this pioneering mentality. And then I got involved very early on, 10 years old, actually, in politics and volunteering on political campaigns and passing out flyers for local community activism and knew that I wanted to grow up and be a lobbyist because sort of at that stage I was still in love with politics and I still had a, a lot of optimism about what politics could still? be. <laughs> yeah still and I was you know very optimistic and, and political 10 year olds and then you know sort of into high school and university where I studied politics. And then I just knew, I'd always known that my path was to live in other countries. And so I did my master's degree in Edinburgh, Scotland, at the University of Edinburgh in politics, more specifically in nationalism studies, which was about studying identity and identity construction and why people think of themselves as who they are and where they're from. And that was a really interesting lens into others that I, I really enjoyed because it also put me permanently in this position of always seeking to understand why people think they are who they are and what matters to them and where that comes from, the history of that, the influences on that. So that really set me up, I think, to then hopefully be a match with some natural empathy to be passionate about really engaging other people and engaging them in making the world a better place by getting involved in understanding their place in society, understanding the positive impact we could have on the environment rather than sort of looking into the dark abyss of climate change, which you could do for a long time, and, and I have for 15 years of my career. So that kind of led me into a career. I've served through sectors. I've been the head of campaigns for Zero Waste Scotland and set up the national recycling campaign in Scotland. I've run a national fair trade body. I've worked for, wait for it, Nestle, the world's largest food company working on their public affairs program. Oh. And also worked for communications agencies, but quite often in leadership roles. So I found myself in leadership roles quite early in my career. So I was the CEO of an NGO by the age of 28. And uh, I'm a little older than that now. 
So I've spent my career sort of surfing sectors and I, I say collecting all the Pokemon cards. So when anyone says, oh, my sector's different, I can say, no, I worked in your sector. And I know there is a commonality to all of them. And that commonality to me is people. And the fact that humans are human and everybody really wants to do a good job. Nobody shows up at work to do a bad job. And if you give people the opportunity to connect to purpose and each other and collaboration, quite often they're up for it. But sometimes they've been in positions or cultures that have allowed them or forced them to forget their humanity, to forget their connection. And so a lot of my work now, I've gone from being really a sustainability consultant and having to explain to people that sustainability is both social and environmental issues, it's not just environment. The pandemic really put that to rest because so many people were working from home. They, they really fully realized that their work life and their personal life are not separate or they didn't want them to be and their values shouldn't be separate and they didn't want them to be. So now I'm increasingly asked to do work on resilience and well-being and most of my work is in leadership while drawing on all of those things, communications, social and environmental issues, connection, because I'm also a mindfulness teacher. I teach meditation and yoga on occasion still. So bringing all of those things together is where the pandemic has landed me. And I'm, I'm having a ball. I'm having the time of my life working online and not having to fly for work because now I live in Barcelona, Spain and have for six years after spending 14 years living in the UK. So I've sort of got this interesting collection of perspectives and it feels like we're having a moment um, collectively. And that's why I'm really happy to be here because I feel like whoever is here today in the audience, you're probably drawn by the idea of allies and partnerships and community and being human and connection. So I find there's a real hunger for that. And obviously the basis of a lot of that is communication and how we engage each other and how we engage around these really important issues that can either stress us out or inspire us. So we're talking social inequality, conflict, environmental degradation, species decline, you know, all of these things that we see in the news. How do we find hope? How do we connect? How do we innovate? And how do we go forward in a way that helps us all to thrive? So that's where I am now. And hopefully that hasn't been too rambling. And I also produce a podcast, which is called The Discomfort Practice, because I'm kind of obsessed with the productive role of discomfort in shaking up our comfort zones and our status quo. And so I interview people from all sectors on how discomfort has shaped who they are and what they do in the world. And it's currently my favorite thing to do. Excellent. Um, excellent. Um, there, there might just be a couple questions later on, on that. Um, okay, I scribbled a few things <laughs> during your intro there. First of all, I thought, oh my goodness, I think we need to arrange a few other webinars to get through. <laughs> some of this awesome content but what struck me um being in okinawa now is um you said people are people and and i just i completely agree people ask me how have you managed there you know how do you pitch to media or work with media i don't speak the language and i don't do the actual pitching but yeah when i sit down across from the publisher the editor-in-chief some things come through you know i mean not just smiles but genuineness authenticity people know if you really are connected, if you want to be connected. So that, um, yeah, that really, that really resonates with me. Thanks. Um, okay, let's get started. Um, uh, first, a bit of background and context. Um, and this is sort of a little level uh, setting for our, for our audience. Um, we know that uh, social and environmental issues are among decision makers and the general public have escalated. Um, the pandemic, but politics, I mean, just so many um, reasons there. So, and we know it's important to the organize, organization's reputations, political platforms, and I'll add in their people and that connectedness, as you just said. Um, so we're here today just to let our audience know, um, because we believe really now is the time to make the most of opportunities to communicate effectively, to really engage uh, with those who can create and change facts and figures, but also solutions. Um, I know you've said, because I have your book, oops, it's hard with the, oh goodness, look at my, oh, there it is. Okay, so there you go. yes, I know you've said um, communications has the power to transform the world. I underline that with a big scribble in the book. Um, if that's not a call to action, uh, I don't know what is. Um, and it's a reminder 
Um, and I mean, I, I don't just mean, and I don't think you did big C communications, my field, but I think just as leaders, um, as leadership, we have this obligation to, to communicate um, small C <laughs> then. Um, okay, so let's get to it. So we'll start with your book because you know I'm a big, big fan. Uh, and <laughs> and um, I did give it a little plug, but okay, if you can't see the title, it's called Communicating Social and Environmental Issues Effectively. So I have a few questions to start with the book. Um, so I won't hold it the whole time. Um, by the way, um, I think your book is more relevant today. Anyway, okay. I'll, let me start with the question first. I want to know how it. I want to know how it came about. So it was published in 2020. You wrote it pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. and yeah, I think the concepts and the ideas are just as relevant. I think they're more relevant today in our new normal. So can you tell me about the book? Why did you write it? How did it come about? Well, it came out of the blue because. Oh man, magical things happen in my life. So I believe if you really follow your path, if you're clear on your purpose, the right opportunities just come to you. And so I'd always thought I would really like to write a book someday, but I don't know what it would be on. And so I just sort of put it out to the universe and left it. And I do that. I'm a bit woo-woo, put it out to the universe. Manifestation or having a vision. It's like Babe Ruth in baseball. He would point at the fences before he hit a home run. So just be like, <laughs> point where you want to go and just let it happen. So I remember I was about to teach a yoga workshop on a Saturday and I had gotten a, a really seemingly random message on LinkedIn from a publisher saying, we have a gap in our portfolio. We don't have any books on what you do. Um, because I had, I was a member of the PRCA, the PR Communications Association in the UK. And something that I noticed at the time, this was probably around 2014, 2015, was that as sustainability issues became a lot more mainstream with businesses, the communication sector and agencies in particular were being asked to deliver on these briefs without having the expertise to do it well. And what that meant was that they were then the chief propagators of greenwash and purpose wash. In other words, putting out communications that were not necessarily verifiable or true. And it was just creating this immense reputational risk, but also just misinforming out of ignorance rather than malice. And so mm -hmm. I started to do trainings for the PRCA on communicating social and environmental issues effectively. So this publisher approached me because of those trainings I was doing and asked me to write a book. And, and I said, well, I'm sure you're interviewing a few other authors. And they were like, nope, just you. So of course you say yes when someone asks you to write a book. <laughs> and then I spent the next two years yeah. starting it and then having to put it on pause because I had, I, I got divorced in there, not to be too personal, but I just, my life changed immensely. But what that turned out to be was perfect timing because I ended up setting aside a couple of months to just write this book in 2019, the end of 2019. And by the time I finished it, the world had already changed to the point where I didn't have to sell the idea that climate change was a reality. I got to talk about it as a crisis because people had arrived at that point where it was no longer in doubt, where sort of mainstream communication sector and businesses had changed their narrative about it. And so it came out, as you said, in summer of 2020, which was, you know, we didn't know there was a pandemic coming. And so, like I said, I think timing is always perfect if you let it be, if you just take your hands off the wheel and let your life kind of drive you where you need to go when you need to be there. And, and I wrote it with the intention of it to be very digestible, very practical. I'm obsessed with impact. And I don't like to talk about things. I like to help people figure out how to do things. And so each chapter is standalone it could be yep. dip in and i need to think about how to engage stakeholders i need to learn about consultation or you can use it as, as a framework to work through chapter by chapter in a team meeting if you wanted to so as you as you can see when she held it up it's not a thick book it's part of a practical guide a practice guide series by the prca and the idea is that it's very digestible and very practical and you can use it as a workbook so it was just I won't say it was a joy to write. It was like being in labor for nine months. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. If anybody's ever written a book, written a book you know, it's not easy, but rewarding. Mm -hmm. And it's so, so rewarding to know that people are finding it useful. So thank you for oh. the feedback, Heather. Oh, no, no, absolutely. Um, it's a little, I mean, jaw dropping is overstating it, but to think that PR agencies were perpetuating or, or 
starting with greenwashing and and he's like, what, how could that, how could that be? I mean, I, I understand, but it's a little like, oh, it kind of gets me deep in there. I mean, I, I, I always talk to my team and, you know, other folks about, we have to figure out what we're going to do. And then we're going to figure out how to say it. You know, we can't figure out what we're going to say and then yeah. think we might do it. I mean, not that we can't be aspirational. Of course we can, but there's, there's a difference there. In the case of you don't know what you don't know. So like I said, there was no malice. It's just, I of mean, course. agencies are always up against budgets and time. So if there's money involved, they'll probably say yes to a brief and figure out how to do it later. And they don't know that they don't know how to do it because these issues are so complex. Yes. You really do need to do your homework on it and, you know, be able to communicate in a more expert fashion, which I think has become more the case as social media has become such a factor and the public are quite wise about a lot of these issues and will react quickly and just clobber you reputationally if they see holes in your argument. So this sector has had to catch up fast, which I find a really good thing because it was just so like forehead smack because, you know, like I said, I've been working in climate change in particular for 15 years and it just felt like playing the fiddle while Rome burned until a certain point. So it's good to have everybody sort of in the same the same place with their understanding of the urgency and the need to communicate these things accurately. Yeah, let it be a reminder, again, as communicators, as as leaders, I mean, of course, we never know what we, we we don't know what we don't know. So how can we always make sure we're asking the right questions and always digging a little deeper? That's a really good question. It's interesting because one of one of my other roles is I work for the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, and we talk a lot about because these are people, mid-level senior professionals from a range of sectors who are really keen to communicate better and have better influence and impacts. And a lot of them don't work in sustainability or social issues. So they're having to get up to speed on these things. And we talk about sources of information because obviously we live in a a sea of misinformation or not fact-checked and it's hard to know who to believe. But I would say it's our responsibility as anyone, not just communicators, to really start to filter what we what we get as information, but also to seek sources of information that trigger us. Because quite often we get in our echo chambers and these algorithms right. on social media put us there further and further and further. But I think being uncomfortable can be quite sharpening. So I would say, if you're just wondering, how do you get informed on good sources of information? If it's just general consumption of the news, always seek out like three sources and make sure one of them is from a viewpoint that is very different to you because it will challenge you and you might learn something. Um, But as a communicator with a capital C, if you work in communication, (laughs) it really is your responsibility to become more expert on particularly controversial issues and complex issues, because it's just an upscaling that we all need to do because these are common issues. They're not niche. Yeah, I I love how you work the discomfort in there (laughs) too. Oh, okay. Let's um back up a little further. Let's talk about the importance of establishing social value and purpose. And you've you've hinted at uh, purpose. It was sort of on the <laughs> edge of my tongue a couple of times. So in other words, like how can we understand the value of our work, the impact of our work, whether we're in leadership positions or not? We've talked about communicators. We've talked about leadership, but. Um, you know, leadership isn't just about the title, right? So, so can we talk about, talk to me a little bit about value and purpose and why they're important. Oh man, this is a that little one. question. <laughs> no. Yeah, because I mean, you could tackle that from a personal standpoint or from an organizational standpoint. So I think I'll start with the personal because I'm going to assume that some or a lot of people here are not professional communicators. Your, your job title isn't yep. in communications. So I really do subscribe to the idea that everyone can and should be a leader, whether or not it's in your job title, whether or not you have a job, but that what we need right now in the world is for everyone to see that they can lead in something. And maybe it's just leading yourself. Maybe it's leading people in your team from the middle. Maybe it is really sticking to your values and leading a culture, even if you're at the bottom of the rung. So being clear on your values is super important. And uh, I keep remembering all these things that I do that I didn't mention. I also am a professor of leadership at a university in Barcelona where I teach leadership to fourth year students. So they're 20, 21 years old. And they're in a course called Global Communications Management. We've just gone back to class last week. 
And we hit them with the idea that they are leaders and they don't quite know what to do with that yet because they think of leadership as something that is by somebody in a hierarchy with a certain job title. Okay. And so what we do is help them to unpack what are your values? What really matters to you? And then what is your purpose? Maybe it's related to work, maybe it's in general. And to just be really clear on what your purpose is. And if you're wondering what the heck I'm talking about, I would encourage you to sort of take a moment. There are plenty of resources online. And this is something that I do with my corporate clients. It's interesting to blow up a senior leadership team's collective brain and be like, what is? what are your individual purposes? And then what's your collective purpose? And a lot of them realize they don't know. And these are people who are 30 years into their career. So being clear on what your purpose is makes you human as well. It means you're not just a worker bee. You're not a piece of machinery. You are human and you have some special sauce that you add to whatever blend you're in. And it's really valuable to understand and value what that is. And I think once you're in touch with that, it gets harder and harder to just do things without being conscious of the impact. So that brings us on to impact. Mm -hmm. Because professionally, I believe you can measure anything. And a lot of people in comms I know struggle. How do you measure the impact of communications? There's always a way. And having worked in the public sector where I had to justify everything I did and everything I spent because I was spending taxpayers' money on it, you get very good at measuring things to justify what you're doing. So it might be that you measure a change in attitude. If, you know, a change in awareness, a change in... What people understand. Behavior? Yeah. Behavior changes. Oh, I wouldn't say easy. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, just, you know, you ask people, do you understand this thing? And then after you've done your piece of work, you ask them again, do you understand this thing? And you get to measure the change in awareness or understanding or behavior. But if you're trying to measure the impact of your personal purpose, you can get creative on that. You could actually measure how much more conscious you are of your purpose when making decisions at work or making decisions in your home life or reacting. So I, like I said, I'm a big proponent of measuring things because it creates a consciousness and becoming more conscious of how you live, how you operate, the impact that you have. If we all did that as how many billion people are on this planet, what would the world look like? How different would it be if we were conscious of our impact with whatever metric works for you? So I'm teaching a mindfulness workshop here in Barcelona tomorrow. And we're going to talk about that, about how do you become more conscious of the impact you have around you? Because that's also the stuff that creates your work culture and your family life. How do you contribute to psychological safety around you? How do you create a more inclusive environment? How do you create a more compassionate place of energy around you? So you could really take all those macro things that you can see in corporate speak or whatever and mm -hmm. make it personal. And I think that that's really important. Uh, I wasn't writing those questions down, but there were about 10 or 20 that I need to write down and have a little reflection on, which just reminds me this session is being recorded, everyone, and you'll, we'll, we'll all be able to go to back in. And also uh, for folks who this isn't a good uh, time, um, we'll be able to access. Uh, so I can go back in and write some of those questions for my own reflection. Pause, but, pause reflect, yeah. breathe, write things down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, just sorry, just the thought of like measuring, pur well, measuring purpose. Yeah. Wow. Like that feels pretty deep. So um, speaking of, speaking of that's it, that purpose and thinking about it in such a meaningful, um, almost intimate, because so personal way. Um, in your book, you talk about the importance of bringing um, my own, your own humanity and values uh, to our work, how that's so important, um, that they can really make our approach to communications, uh, well, social issues, authentic, strategic, less risky, more effective. Like that's a pretty awesome list. What did I say? <laughs> authentic, strategic, less risky, more effective. Yes, I'll take all of those. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, this really resonates with me personally. I mean, I just find it so compelling and so meaningful that my humanity can be an asset. I and mean, when we talk about superpowers, I mean, what a beautiful thought. So how can I, how can I do that? How can we do that? But without bringing like my biases or subjectivity or like elements that might get away in the strategic approach. So 
in other words, I'll, I'll be a bit more clear and concise. I'll, I'll get there. How do strategy and humanity come together in the best way possible? Oh my gosh, that is such a good question. How do strategy and humanity come together in the best way possible? Well, first of all, is acceptance that you are human. And what you said about biases is really useful because we all have biases. We all have unconscious biases. And if people don't know, there's a really wonderful project by Harvard where you can just find them online and do um, unconscious biases tests to find out where yours lie. And it might be based on color or gender or um sexual orientation or whatever but just accept we all have unconscious biases and it doesn't make you a bad person it just makes you human so i think in in really embracing being human means embracing that you do have your own set of biases and background and weaknesses but also on the other side of that is strengths and whenever you shine a light on something that you were formerly unconscious of you can then work with it it's like trying to measure purpose. Once you're conscious that you can measure purpose, you can find a way to do it. So once you're conscious of the things that could get in your way of being strategic or engaging others, and just simply accept that you are human and you do have those things, you can deal with them. You can make sure that you're operating with your eyes wide open and an understanding of what you're really driving around with you. And then you can also hopefully transform some of them. But in terms of how humanity, being human and strategy, match. How inspiring is it to work with a leader who is fully human, who allows you to be human because they admit that they have flaws. They admit that they don't get things right. But then the other thing is we have so much intelligence that isn't just in our brains and reminding ourselves that we aren't robots. We actually have gut instinct. We actually have that little knowing that we've often untrained ourselves to listen to. So actually doing maybe something that we call it somatic work, body work that just gives you a chance. And you can do this anytime. I do this with a lot of my clients, my meditation students, a lot of leaders, closing your eyes and just breathing and starting to ask yourself what you feel in your body and where, because a lot of people don't know the answer to that because we have not created a connection between our body and our brain. So those neural pathways have to be built by asking the question over and over again. And then you start to notice you do have a gut instinct. Your body does tell you when something is unsafe or unwise, or when you're about to do something that creates a reputational risk. And therefore listening to that allows you to be more strategic and hopefully coupled with maybe an awareness of your purpose, to be courageous in listening to that because you're like, no, no, my instinct knows. We call our gut our second brain. That's actually true. Mm. And we have an awful lot of intelligence there that we just tamp down because we have this thing about our brains being absolutely everything when we have a lot more intelligence to access that we've kind of forgotten. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of more popularity, things like breath work, the Wim Hof method, and yes. you know, a, a lot of things that you wouldn't consider sort of woo-woo, but just, you know, they're common sense where you're actually drawing on all of your body, all of your intelligence. But final thing on this is believing that you can be strategic and that your role, if you are in communications or even not in a leadership position, you can play a role and should play a role as a gatekeeper. If something doesn't feel right to you, you have intelligence and probably expertise that will be valuable in ensuring that you don't do something that's not gonna land right. Listen to yourself. And a lot of that is around building trust in yourself and building the habits of listening to yourself. So a lot of it's habitual as well. Practice. Um, so humanity and strategy are already overlapping. <laughs> we don't have to think about how to make them overlap. Be. You don't have to do, just be human, yeah. embrace that, get more familiar with what it is to actually, you are human. So what does that mean? How can you be in that, in your strategy session, basically? Yeah. And I hadn't, I mean, I must admit, I hadn't really thought about it in connection to strategy. I've thought about it a lot in relation to leadership because um, I really lean in to the humanity, the um, sort of genuineness um, of, of leadership, that feels really comfortable to me. I think it's important. Uh, I hadn't thought about leaning into strategy in the same in the same way. It feels a little nerve wracking, you know, like what if, what if, but um, wow, thank you. 
<laughs> but also I'm just thinking about, is it, I think it's 80% of our communications is unspoken. It's body language and it's, it's the energy that we emanate, which is actually a really good reminder that so much goes on that isn't about our words, that isn't about proving a point. It's about who we are and what energy we show up in, whether we're stressed, whether we're connected to ourselves or disconnected, whether we're empathetic. So just remember how much is communicated without you're ever consciously saying anything. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of um, ideas of, of appreciative inquiry, like really leaning into your strengths mm. to that humanity. So, you know, we talk about like, okay, I have to improve my weaknesses. Okay, sure. But what about really understanding our strengths and leaning into those strengths and allowing those strengths to become even, even, even better, um, okay. even richer, even part, more part of what we do. I would compliment that by saying also, what about leaning into our weaknesses or owning them? You know, it goes back to being human and also allowing yourself to be human. So I think we are taught, particularly in the Western societies we come from, to be quite competitive and invulnerable and tough and, you know, just move fast and break things. But actually leaning into being still and empathetic and admitting your weaknesses can be quite strong as well. So I think both are a good approach. I think we need both to be fully human. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I love that you mentioned Wim, Wim, what's the deep, the breathing, the, the Wim Hof. Cold, Wim Hof. <laughs> so I love cold water. I love cold water swimming. So we didn't know that connection. <laughs> beforehand I've, I've certainly done um I, I don't follow him I haven't practiced with him but I've certainly brought my own version to a few, few so Canadian you, Heather <laughs> we've got cold water what am I going to do with it swim in it yeah yeah I'm not on myself but I do like the breathing <laughs> yeah I um I actually been craving cold water <laughs> since being here and I never did that it was just a pandemic thing the pools are closed oh geez why don't I go jump in a lake <laughs> It's a great reset for your nervous system, actually. And we live in such a we live in such a state of heightened stress quite often because of work, because of if we live in cities, and actually just giving yourself that reset where your body knows how to shut off stress quite efficiently. And that's actually part of the point of the, the ice baths that he does. Well, that was a very, very civilian explanation of the neuroscience <laughs> behind it. But yeah, yeah, it's a really it's a good thing to do. Very good. Um, okay, let's shift a little from so the personal a bit more to the outward uh, facing. So to audience, to stakeholders, um, just back to the book a little. Um, you talk about working with allies, advocates, and partners. Um, let's again, like level set. Can you talk to to us about how you define them and their and their value? Well, I think. The clue is usually in the name, allies, advocates, and partners. Allies are the people who are alongside you. And those are the organizations or the specific stakeholders within your own organization who you know are allied with whatever you're trying to do. And we're talking about social and environmental issues in particular. So maybe you're working on diversity and inclusion or supply chain, working about having more sustainable supply chains and not exploiting the farmers down the way in your supply chain or whatever. So obviously allies are the people who they're probably a natural fit. Mm -hmm. And I really encourage people to, to map. And even if this is not your job, it's kind of useful to see who are your allies. Do a map, you know, do a little sphere with a few circles in it. Who's in the closest one? Who are those people or organizations? And then the next is, I think partners is the next one because it's, who then can do the same thing who can it's it's ally but more active so it's the people who will run a campaign with you or sponsor something or put out the message to their own followers or whatever so they're not just allies they're more active and then advocates are super active in all of that they're the people who are going to champion they're the evangelists they're the ones who are going to go to go to war for you so it might be your boss who sells it to the ceo or it might be somebody on if you're an influencer or you're on social media or somebody who will really get out there and make it their own cause so kind of subtle differences but it, it helps the reason i differentiated between them in that way was thinking from a communicator perspective when you come up with a communications plan or a campaign mapping who's in which of those buckets and there's always overlap 
So there might be somebody who is an advocate, an ally, and a partner, or there might be somebody who's just a partner and they're not gonna say much about it, but they'll put the money in or give some resources or whatever, expertise. And then there are allies and that's your gang of other people who or organizations who will help you to either think about it better or they might then become partners who help you deliver it or then they might go all the way to becoming advocates and get the word out. So, you know, think of those as very interchangeable categories. There's definitely okay. a flow between them, but it's just an interesting lens to use to start thinking of how you can have an impact when you communicate something in particular. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, um, so all those different groups are um, in your corner. Um, let's talk to me then about why uh, innovation and uh, diverse thinking mm. is crucial and how it connects to those groups, how we can use it to, to, to go further in our communications or in addressing any challenges. Well, if you think of basically the, the potted definition of innovation is about doing things differently. Mm -hmm. And how can you do things differently if you all see things the same way? I mean, you can, but you're going to have a very homogeneous perspective, which means there's going there are going to be things that you don't know you don't know, that you don't have the lived experience or the perspective to bring. And so therefore having a more diverse range of perspectives in the room or involved in a project is going to make a more well-rounded solution. But there's a discomfort that comes with that because when you invite true diversity, when you create true diversity, it means you're going to be working with, communicating with, trying to collaborate with people who don't see things the way you see things. And so then you have to become an even more expert communicator, even more consciously empathetic, even more conscious about your own unconscious biases in order to engage them productively and empower them and enable them and create an environment in which everyone is safe to bring their perspective to what will eventually be a really good solution. I'm gonna use a controversial example that I can't put in writing because I don't wanna get sued, but anybody remembers, don't worry Heather, I'm not gonna get you in trouble. If anyone remembers, there was a Pepsi advert a few years ago where it was Kendall Jenner uh, with a bunch of Black Lives Matter protesters and she was drinking a Pepsi and like the police, you know, loving the police and loving the protesters. And it was just so tone deaf to what was actually going on to use sort of a very privileged white woman and selling a product on the back of a social movement that was, you know, it's a pretty hot topic. It's a heated topic. Yeah. And the creative team who did that, they won awards for it and they thought they did a fantastic job. But to be so unable to read the room, read the wider room yeah. to that level, actually I think points to probably not necessarily diversity of the makeup of the group, but just a complete lack of perspective on what was going on in the outside world. You also see that with like, I have acquaintances who worked in major newsrooms in the UK ahead of the Brexit vote. And they had to have a real moment of reckoning after Brexit happened because I've had a couple of friends say, we did not see it coming. We thought, oh, this will never happen. But then we realized we totally missed so much because we didn't realize how similar we all are in our perspective, in the news we consume and make. And so they realized that actually going, you know, creating a more diverse workforce isn't just about because they have to because of policy or they have to because of public opinion. They have to because it makes them better at what they do. It makes them better at what they deliver to the world's communicators. And so it's one of those things that it can kind of be brushed aside as being very politically correct or political. And it's unfortunate because it actually misses the point that diversity makes us better. We talk about diversity in the gene pool and it makes us more robust and able to uh, you know, evolve past certain diseases and, and it makes us stronger as human beings. So why would we not seek to replicate that in the environment around us and our ability to create innovative solutions to things that are really making life uncomfortable for a lot of people? So yeah, that's my kind of long-winded and passionate answer about that, but <laughs> I'm just struck. Um it's a reminder, um, yes, for communicators, but for other leaders too, um, about this idea of being tone deaf and well, not knowing what we, do, you know, don't, not knowing what we don't know. You know, links back to that. 
and a reminder to reach out, to ask people for feedback, to get ideas on your work. And I know you talk so much about consultation, true consultation. So, um, so I want to ask about, about consulting, but before I do, um, let's just, um, I'll just talk to the room for a sec about social license, because that may be a term that not, um, that everyone uses. So really it's about um, ongoing acceptance or approval from our community um, and not in the face of different opinions. <laughs> I don't mean that, but, um, but approval from stakeholders. So, so consulting them to involve them, even when we have differences, which we want. So I know the idea of consulting stakeholders is good in theory, <laughs> but I mean, in practice, um, I think I, many of us or some of us are thinking it can be hard, it can be time consuming, expensive, nerve wracking. What if it doesn't yield meaningful results? What if I forget someone and then they're even more upset with me? Um, and I don't want, not that I know, but I don't want to think consulting just to tick the box. I mean, that's not help. That's not what you mean. And that's not helpful to anyone too. So can you, can you chew on this a little bit with us? Like talk to us about effective, meaningful, effective, meaningful <laughs> methods of consultation, but again, not just for the sake of consultation. So how, how can, how, how is this doable? Talk, talk to us about that, but where the rubber hits the road. Oh yeah. This is why I have basically an entire chapter in the book about consultation, because I've heard that so many times working with NGOs who never have enough budget to do everything they need to do or yes. comms agencies who are always on a tight budget. So it's one of those things that gets tossed out the window quite easily. And, and it is possibly the most important thing to have a long-term impact. Mm -hmm. So for me, consultation doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be hard. And it's also about what you then do with it. Like you said, if you're just consulting to consult because you have to tick moving on, but people want to know what you've done with what they told you. And that's what truly engages them in a stronger solution. So I really like the concept of co-creation. And I know it's a word, mm. you know, it's probably one people use a lot, but yeah. genuinely doing it, co-creating is a magical thing to do, not only for creating a solution or an approach that actually works for the people you're trying to reach or engage or work with, it gets them bought into it. And it also mm. creates a better... A better approach. So for me, not consulting is just kind of dumb. <laughs> it's a wasted opportunity because why would you leave it to just you or your team to create a campaign or a solution with just your brains when you could ask a bunch of brains? And <laughs> behavior change work schooled me in this because you, when you consult and you ask people, would this actually work to help you change your behavior to do the thing that I need you to do, which is, you know, maybe it's recycling more or wasting less or being conscious about their water use or whatever environmental behavior it's trying to change. And you can count on it. They will say, no, I hate that. I hate that messaging. I hate that approach. But then they will tell you what does work. So you don't have to be all knowing. You don't have to be a magician. It's as easy as just asking. And people who work in marketing quite often are very good at this. They market test everything because then you know that the result will be they buy more of what you're trying to sell them, which is the entire point. So I would say think more like marketing people and you can't afford not to consult because you are creating risk or you're missing real opportunities or you're going to come up with a solution that might work for you, but might not work for them. Because always remember, you are most likely not your audience. So you don't truly understand them, right. you can ask them. <laughs> it's, it's really, and some methods, I'll just quickly name a few of my favorite methods because sure. if you've ever worked at a communications agency, they're really good at doing this on the cheap. When I worked for one in London, we would just go send one of the juniors on the team to stand in front of a supermarket with a clipboard and ask people questions. You know, sort of be like, all right, we think our target demographic is probably in this area, so. Okay. Go stand outside, look for people we think fit that profile that we're trying to reach, which mm. might be like moms between 30 and 45 or whatever, and just take them through a set of questions, ask 20 people, and it's not a representative sample, but it will give you some insight. So that's actually a really good, cheap way to do it. We live in a digital age. Google surveys are incredibly easy to do, and then you can analyze them quite easily. Um, 
There are a lot of people, you can Google how to write a good survey because asking the right questions is important, but it's free. Google surveys are free. <laughs> so I would encourage you to look at what you have access to now, or you can do what I do, which is at the beginning of any session I run on say, resilience or well-being or managing stress or managing your energy, we always ask people at the start of a session to go onto a platform like Slido or WooClap or one of these many platforms you can use to poll people and just have them take five minutes, use their phone, answer a set of questions about how do you feel today? What's your stress level from one to five? What do you, what's your impression of this concept we're looking at? Do you know much about it? And then you ask the same questions at the end. And even within a session, you can consult, you can measure, you can also gather feedback and ask them, wow. what do you want us to do differently next time? What do you think we did well this time? And you get immense insight and then you build your own insight because don't forget, this is also about you as a communicator, yeah. making your insight better. You're becoming more expert in knowing your audiences and you start to gain more of an instinct. So I would say thinking that you can't consult it's really, it's a hard argument to make these days because we yeah. have so many really great and free online resources. You just have to change your thinking and think always building consulting early and it's going to benefit you in the long run. Yeah, um, I wrote down a couple notes as you were um, sharing those ideas and one that um, I, I literally, I wrote this down um, when you're talking about standing in front of the supermarket with a clipboard. Um, there's elegance and simplicity. You know, some of these solutions <laughs> don't have to be so complex. There's something really beautiful about solutions that, um, yeah, don't use every gadget and every, every <laughs> 25 different options in front of us. So, so yeah, what a, what a reminder. Also, I wrote down, put your ego away. People don't I like quite it. often tell people when it's say you're testing a message, whether it's so I remember speaking at a conference in the UK for environmental communicators a few years back, and it was largely environmental NGOs. And I stood on stage at like nine in the morning, the second day of this conference and said, don't get married to your message, because what works for you probably won't work for your target audience. And they're going to tell you that they hate it, but then they'll tell you what works. And people were just like, <gasps> because we have to stop caring why people do things. If we want people to do the things that we think are the, the ultimate aim in terms of behavior change or listening to a message, you have to stop caring about why they do it. Let them do it for whatever reason they want to do it for, and then find a way to appeal to that reason. So for example, my family are very conservative, religious, Republican okay. in the United States. They don't believe in climate change and they voted for he whom I shall not name twice. And um, I grew up having to learn, because obviously I'm very different from them, that my parents are actually environmentalists, but don't you dare call them that. Call them stewards of God's creation. And they don't run the water when they're brushing their teeth. They do try to recycle as much as possible. They take care of their neighbors. You know, they have this idea of, they have very good behaviors, but it's for a reason that sort of, environmental lobbyists and NGOs wouldn't present it to them as being. They would want them to have to sign up to these behaviors for the same reasons they sign up. So I'd also say like, don't get married to your message. Let people join in however they need to join in. And that also comes back to diversity of perspective, diversity of messaging maybe, because appreciate that it's okay that people have different reasons to do things. As long as it's, you know, we're aligned on some things let go of the why, let go of why they're there. Let go, let go of it, yeah. Um, this reminded me of, we're redoing our website uh, right now after many, many years, we're redoing our website. And when I was uh, giving them the um, necessary presentation to the executive about what's coming, um, I was explaining to them that we don't tell people how to use our website. People use our website how they use our website. <laughs> people just do it. It's, so if they don't get somewhere, if they're not clicking where you want, it's because that's how they're using the website. You know, this idea of like coming to people where they're at. It's not them, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that, I mean, people are going to do what they're going to do. So 
you know, especially on an, on a website where you're not there, you know, I don't know, telling them exactly everything to do, not that you're anywhere, you know, in a store telling people to buy something or where to vote or anything else. You're, we're nowhere. So well, it's, it's based on sort of, yeah, let their behaviors lead you because certain sectors are really good at this. So if you know any UX designers, user yes. designers, they map and you're probably going through all of this with your website, you know, yes. user journeys. where do people want to click? And you sort of realize every time somebody has to scroll, you lose 25% of the people who are looking at that page or people read in a certain shape. And it, therefore, you need to put things where they need to see them, and where they yes. will follow them, rather than thinking, why aren't you using the website the way I want yes. to use it? So sort of back to front, and it is about just kind of laughing at yourself and realizing, oh, I did it again. I'm trying to get them, you know, to do it my way. So do it their way and see how the impact changes, right? Yes, see, <laughs> let's measure the difference. <laughs> Okay, speaking of yes, going out to our audience, connecting, communicating with audience, how, well, we're in this era of, you know, fake news and, and this sort of stuff, how can we tell stories? How can we cut through that? And I don't just mean from the facts point of view, um, but like with stories that are more inspiring and more engaging, you know, with stories that are, um, you know, really authentic and have an impact, you know? So again, sort of, I'm guessing that's about fake news, not like, oh, this is the fact, that's not the fact, but just stuff that sort of cuts about it because mm -hmm. I mean, kind of like who cares about some of the stats, right? I mean, how can we inspire people? I'll do water too, good idea, thank uh, you. <laughs> well, I remember we had discussed originally calling this session something like whoever tells the best story wins. Yes. <laughs> We're talking about science in particular, this is the United Nations Science Summit. So. Um, Having really killer facts and figures is great, but it's how you tell the story. So I, I also think it's useful to understand how humans work. So we have a natural negative bias and that is human biology. That is kind of an evolutionary design flaw, but it's down to survival. So we see fear, we sense fear. So a story that triggers fear of others, of situations, of catastrophe, and the logical parts of our brain shut off because we get into a fight or flight mode. So we're basically in kind of our, our more primal parts of our brain. And it's much harder to reach people who are operating in fear or who are stuck in doom and gloom, which of course, there is a verifiable researched negative bias in the media. Sorry if there are any journalists here, but the reality is we react more strongly to negative stories and fear. And so we have to, work harder to reach people with inspiration, but it's possible. So when we're in fight or flight, we are pumping cortisol, all of those great old stress hormones, and we stay in that. This is another evolutionary design flaw because animals, they switch that on, they run away from the predator, and then they shake and they turn it off. We stay in that heightened state of stress, and it's why we have a lot of hypertension, stress-related diseases. So the way to counteract that is to be able to trigger positive emotion in people, to counter that negative emotion. And so, like I said, it doesn't matter how good your stats are. If you can't tell a story that inspires people, you're not gonna cut through the fear that's out there. So that is about mastering it. It's a skill. And it's not something you either have or don't have. It's a skill, I teach it. The people in my Cambridge course are there on a course called Communicating for Influence and Impact. We have an entire module on storytelling. We spend weeks on storytelling. Practice it. Use anecdotes. Be personal. Use language that is understandable. And particularly for those of you who are maybe in communicating scientific facts or engineering or technical stuff of any kind, don't worry that you're dumbing it down by making it understandable. You need to if you're going to reach people. And obviously there are certain audiences who you will need to get very technical with. So consider your audience is the main thing here. But also remember everyone is human at the end of the day. So even if you're, you have to be quite complex and technical, how can you inspire them? How can you structure it in a way that it is a good story? There's an arc in a story. You know, it's storytelling is as old as humans. So is there a good beginning? Are there clear points? Is there a clear call to action or appeal to something? And then a conclusion. Can you signpost to people where they are in the story as you go? And also, can you do it briefly? So for example, if you're making videos or if you're doing things online, we know 
two minutes is optimal for our attention span these days. So can you provide a killer story, killer points, and a punchline that is aimed directly at a specific audience in the language they need and appealing to what motivates them? How can you give them what they need? But can you do it in two minutes? That is masterful. And it only happens from practice, which is why we make our students make a bunch of videos. And I've done the same. If anybody else here has ever um, had to watch themselves back on a recording and knows how excruciatingly painful that is. Yes, it's painful, but it's discomfort that's well worth experiencing because it will make it better. Yes. And how can you use anecdotes, colorful language, paint a picture for people? So just mm -hmm. kind of take those away and chew on them, but also maybe take a communications course or do a workshop online or watch some YouTube videos about effective storytelling. There are a million TED Talks. If you want to see masterful storytelling, watch a oh. TED Talk. So much practice goes into that. I've helped people prepare to give TED Talks. And there's months and months and months of scripting and back and forth with the TEDx team or whatever. And then there's this masterfully told story. But it's because there's been hours and hours and hours of practice behind it. So watch, take notes, figure out what works. What is good storytelling? Analyze it and then see how you can, you can make that a skill set that you have or build or practice. Yeah. And I think that applies to so, so many of us. I mean, we're all trying to communicate every day in all different ways. I mean, you know, the folks that give awesome TED Talks come from all walks of life. Um, so I think, I think these things apply to every, absolutely everyone. If you're, at a, if you're at a science conference and you're delivering something, how can you do it in the most effective way? How can you really inspire your, your audience? Um, okay, so we're talking about the inspiring, the storytelling, the bringing people in. How, um, so my pen. Um, how do we, um, at the same time, build trust in facts and data? And I don't like to do the fact heavy facts and data, but of course, sometimes it's absolutely needed and can be compelling. So how do we, um, how do we build trust in facts and data and inspire people to embrace? Um, discomfort, which you've, which you've brought in again there, and, and really to redesign our systems, our societies, the comfort zones. Like, how, how can we sort of evolve together? Oh, Heather, there are so many questions in there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> choose, choose what you like. We should go on retreat and take a few days to unpack this one. I'll start okay. with the, the truth, the facts and figures, and then we can move on to it. How do we? Okay, thank you. Okay. So somebody I know who is quite often a speaker from a Cambridge course, Matt Peacock, he used to be director of corporate communications for Vodafone group. And like, he's, he used to be the work for the BBC quite high up, but he said something recently, which was it's never been harder to get away with wrongdoing or more difficult to convince people of the truth. So that's the context we're in where nobody knows who to believe. And distrust, I know one of your speakers at the summit is from Edelman in Japan, and the Edelman Trust Barometer comes out every year. And the headline for the most recent one was that trust is at an all-time low. So people's default is distrust, which of course makes it very hard to move forward as a society when you don't know who or what to trust. So it is a tricky question, and I don't have a lot of answers. <laughs> We're working on that one collectively, but I think... I mean, it kind of goes back to being able to tell a good story. People will trust you if they like you. So also building relationships with people you need to communicate with, being human, and also being really robust. There isn't a lot of room for error. And even if you get everything right, remember there will be people who don't believe you if your, your facts don't match the facts they want to believe. So we kind of just have to do our best and also keep trying to connect with each other as human. I think it's not the answer, but therein lies an answer. Because something I'm seeing, and I don't know about those in this session, if you agree with this or if you're feeling this, but I've just seen a real craving for connection and people really Absolutely. seeking to build community in a new way because we've been so brutally and suddenly isolated during this pandemic. And so I think the answer lies partly in connection to other people and building community and recognizing a great term, interbeing, that all things, all people, the planet, we are connected. So I think 
while we're talking about communications and you know i i choose not to get bogged down in the this ugh, the swamp of misinformation and who's right and media sources because it is an endless debate but if you connect with others also you need to question your unconscious biases as you do so because the people you like the people you want to believe might be people who are just very like you and that's not necessarily going to be a robust answer so i go back to one of my earlier answers about seek out different sources of information and seek what makes you uncomfortable which also ties into true diversity but also seek to connect with other people as human beings and again step back and remember most people aren't seeking to be evil most people aren't proactively or consciously seeking to be deceptive or to do a bad job People are often just reacting in their own biases. They're often reacting in fear, which is such a powerful driver. We've talked about that. So if you can bring empathy, calm, really active listening and the ability to truly listen, you're gonna bring a lot to communications because most people are seeking to just, they're just thinking about the thing they're gonna say in response to what someone's saying to them. They're not actually listening. So learning to just take a breath and calm your own nervous system. Because if, if you start to become conscious of how much stress you probably operate in every day, as we all do, and practice calming it, just take three breaths. Breathe into your belly because then you're literally signaling to your nervous system and your brain that you don't need to be ready to run away from, oh, you know, like a saber-toothed tiger that's trying to kill you or a tribe in the next village that's going to take you as a slave because that's not going to happen, frankly, unless you live in a context and you're probably not on this webinar. But take time to calm yourself and come back to being human rather than reacting in that animal brain, that stress, and listen and be able to see the scene. And this also plays into being strategic. You have to be able to take that wider sort of helicopter hovering view. And you can't do that if you're stressed because you're in a reactive mode. So the less reactive you can be, the better you're going to be at listening, the better you're going to be at communicating, and the better you're going to be at connecting with other people. You've um, made so many connections back to different things we've already talked about. I, I noted down a few. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for um, mentioning the trust um, barometer. It's next week. <laughs> Please join us. <laughs> a good one. It was a good barometer every year. Yeah, so that'll be next week. Thank, thanks for that plug. Um, we, I mean, we've used the word connection or words that are synonyms a few times. And um, it reminds me of um, early in the pa pandemic, I was uh, running town halls, not unlike this conversation um, for the organization where I was at. Um, all the staff were invited. It was really about asking questions of, of leadership um, of all different sorts. And um, when we surveyed folks um, after a few and then periodically about different topics, you know, um, oh goodness, yeah, like strategy, how strategy going to change, how are targets going to change? Um, so that sort of element, um, there were a lot of work from home questions, you know, so we did a, a survey about what people want to hear about, what they want to get out of the town hall. And town halls tr traditionally can be a little um, tense sometimes, <laughs> um, depending what's going on in your culture. And, we, we did some periodic surveying and guess what came to the top, but what people wanted. I mean, yes, people wanted to know if they could buy a chair at home. Okay, fine. But beyond that, that they could buy a chair or a new screen connection, yeah. people showed up to the town halls every Friday for connection. I mean, you know, when you think of town halls, people don't traditionally think of connection. They think of kind of animosity sometimes or like, and there were tense moments. It's not that it's not that it was all roses, but, you know, once um, I saw the results, okay, well, then how can we build that in around some of the nitty gritty that we had to do? Um, I love, um, you know, I hate saying sort of silver linings, but, you know, silver lining pandemic that connection has. Um, risen to the top, we've realized the important because it's something that I um, appreciate. So yeah, silver lining there is. Um, we've had a wonderful moment to reset and it's it's been the positive impact of a really difficult period collectively because nobody's nobody's 
missed this moment. It's been so universal and so isolating. It's been interesting starting to travel again and just noticing there's a joy. People yes. are joyful to have tourists back. People are joyful to be tourists. And it's just, there's a, there's a real, yeah, there's a connection. There's a reconnection because you don't realize what you have till it's gone quite often. And so smelling the roses. Yeah. So it in. is a, a new appreciation of something that we just didn't realize we had until it was gone. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a little like your health, you know, as soon as you, um, I don't know, sprain your ankle or something, all of a sudden you realize how much you appreciate your, your health and you appreciate movement and how your body gets you around everywhere. I recently yeah. sprained my ankle, so I'm still howling. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, but I can <laughs> totally relate. It's just like, I was thinking that the other day of, oh my gosh, I took it so for granted that I could just run or just walk fast somewhere. And it's, yeah, it, it's amazing. So actually I would say, it's a really good moment to reflect on what we realize afresh we didn't know we had. And, and I think connecting to that and realizing that's universal is another point of connection with others of just, you know, you can, you can shoot the breeze with people on the, the Metro now about whatever people. Okay. I live in Barcelona, which is kind of notoriously unfriendly to be perfectly honest. So what I have enjoyed is now I know my neighbors. I've lived in the same building for six years and they always just ignored me in the hallway as the foreigner in the building. And now like we chat, we have a WhatsApp group and it's really broken the ice uh, or the icy exterior in some places. I would be interested in hearing if anybody in this, um, this session has found the same, but people smile at each other on the street now more than they ever did before. So yeah, I think there's been a real appreciation rather than guardedness, we realize we're really alone when we're not together. And that actually just being able to be collectively out in the open together, it, it feels closer, it feels more human. So yeah, I'm really grateful. And it makes communicating easier. Like it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, well, speaking of humanity, which has been this um, nice red thread that we've had come through, um, talk to us more about discomfort. And by the way, I'm dying to use the word discomfortable, <laughs> um, dis <laughs> which I know is not a word. I know, but you know, you see discomfort. I mean, it just is almost like coming off the tip of your tongue. So talk to us about this important topic. How did it come into your world? Like, what? I mean, you've, you, you, you've given us some hints along the way. We've heard it come out in different ways, but um, so talk to us about sort of your journey in thinking about finding discomfort. And then if we could sort of lead that into like, okay, how can I make it work for me? It sounds kind of scary. Well, the scary is the point really, but yeah, I, uh, I'm someone who discomfort is kind of my comfort zone. So because of my background, because I am so incredibly different from my family, different from the place I'm from, I'm from a place that nobody really understands or knows much about. So I was always getting to explain myself or define myself. And, you know, most people just don't, they, they can't picture where I'm from or who I am. So I've become very good at fitting in and letting people think I'm like them until I break the news that I'm from a slightly different background or, you know, whatever. And also because I'm really passionate about systems change and social justice and mm. treating the earth in a way that, you know, means we can all thrive in the future. It's uncomfortable because it means questioning the way that our systems have been structured in an understanding at the time they were created, I'm talking about capitalism, you know, where they're based on the idea that we can endlessly use resources, that humans are resources to create things that the earth has natural resources that we can use to make things sort of endlessly. And, and essentially exploitation is baked into the system. It's not that the system's broken. The system is working just fine. We've created <laughs> yes. that exploits people. And that in order to have things made cheaply that we can consume, we have had to be programmed to be consumers, to then work, to buy the things that we've been programmed to consume and that somebody along the way somewhere has to be exploited and lower on the food chain than us in order to provide that enjoyment of the system. So Betsy, before you go on, can I just insert a teeny tiny thing here? 
and mm-hmm. use this as a plug for another session we're doing next week, which is around decolonizing science. Oh. And the image that the, the organizer of that gave me to put into the program, it's a meme and it says, um, the system's not broken, it was built this way. For, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, the system is not broken, the system's fine, it's just the wrong system. <laughs> Yeah. It, okay. it Thanks for that. A very narrow band of people. And, and I'm here to admit it benefits me. I am, you know, I am a white woman with two very powerful passports and I had access to education and, you know, whatever my background, I, I am privileged that the system benefits me. But actually, what I have felt quite passionate about doing since I was very young, literally like seven, eight years old, is using my privilege to open the doors to other people to to readjust the system or create new ones. And I quite enjoy that role. And I think part of it is personality, but also sure. the fact that I just was never bred to fit in. And so I like that role of disruptor. It fits me quite well. And I figured out where it doesn't work and have ended up creating a life and a role that embraces it. People hire me to be disruptive. People hire me to be the external person they brief to say the things they can't say to their CEO. And so it is, it's, it's a fun role to be in, but discomfort, like I said, I, I walk in a room and it makes people uncomfortable. I've worked for <laughs> certain companies where I look like this and I just walk in as myself and people just look scared of me. And I'm like, I'm really nice. I'm actually really nice. So it kind of hurts my feelings, but I'm also quite tall. So I think that just, that combination just made people who want to just, you know, ride the gravy t- train to, to retirements and just don't disrupt the system because it works for them. I can be a little scary. But I also then, of course, trained as a yoga teacher and the type of yoga that I teach predominantly these days is called yin yoga. And it's about being very still in certain- Sorry, a good moderator has an alarm, sorry. Ah, (laughs) You also have my bells, but it's about sitting, I I say on the edge, you find your edge of what's comfortable and then you sit there. And even when it starts to get you might be sitting in a hip opener for a minute and think, this is a breeze. And then something changes and you just think, how do I leave? How do I leave? How do I leave? And rather than moving and making yourself more comfortable, you breathe and you let go instead and you let yourself sink into the discomfort and then you watch your comfort zone expand. So that has become a beautiful metaphor for what I've stepped into more and more professionally, which is that your comfort zone isn't necessarily good for you. It's just what is comfortable for you. And that on the other side Mm -hmm. of your comfort zone is a bigger comfort zone, but you have to get uncomfortable first. You have to challenge systems. You have to challenge your biases. You have to challenge yourself to grow. And if you go to the gym, you know, you don't build new muscle until you break down the old muscle. So expansion only comes from breaking down your comfort zone, from breaking down what kind of worked for you or maybe didn't really work for you. So I say at the beginning of my podcast that on the other side of discomfort lie your superpowers, because it's true. It's sort of like the concept of if you're not afraid of hearing no, you can ask for anything. And quite often you'll get a yes. So it's about towing up to the line, figuring out where the edge of your comfort zone is, getting there. And it might mean getting more activists. It might be questioning your own beliefs. It might be questioning your own comfort zone and why it's comfortable for you and what privilege that entails. But challenging it and recognizing that actually only good things can come from that and that pain is not to be avoided. Pain is just part of life. It's part of being being brought into this world. You know, your mother had to go through pain to bring you into this world, but what a great thing that was, right? So it's not something to be avoided. And we spend so much time with good vibes only or trying to avoid discomfort, trying to avoid difficult conversations or making ourselves uncomfortable by saying something that actually aligns with our values when we see something at work happening that isn't Or we say, this is going to create a risk if we communicate it this way, or this story is not going to land with people. That's uncomfortable. But what ultimately can happen from that discomfort is going to probably be positive. So I'm a bit of an evangelist for the idea that discomfort is not to be avoided, it's to be sought out. Because I think I said this earlier, something along the lines of 
what would the world be like if we were always constantly trying to grow and not avoid discomfort? If we were questioning things, if we were having difficult conversations fearlessly, but with empathy and compassion, because you don't have to be a jerk to be out of your comfort zone. You, have, you don't have to be confrontational to be having a difficult conversation. So it's about actually also being kind to yourself. Because there are some days when it's okay to be in your comfort zone. That's where you need to be to recover, or you're just, you don't have the energy to be always pushing the envelope. And this is, I'm talking to myself here. So <laughs> those days when you take your foot off the gas and take care of yourself and just maybe right, you thank know, you. paddle in place and recover for the next round of training, of challenging, of growing, because it's ultimately, if you do it based on values and purpose and curiosity, then it will get you to interesting places. And I would say good places. I, I heard a quote recently and I'm trying to remember who said it, somebody very well known and I can't remember, but the idea that fear and curiosity cannot coexist. And I love that concept, particularly when, when you think about discomfort, because if you enter everything with curiosity, that powerful fear that keeps us from expanding or thinking strategically, it can't exist. There's not space for it. So how can you enter difficult conversations with curiosity? How can you enter strategy with curiosity? How can you enter things that you're a little afraid of with curiosity, things you don't know with curiosity? Because it takes us a very different place. And I think it, it brings a very different energy. And also that's infectious. Because if you are making yourself uncomfortable, if anybody's a fan of Brene Brown, she talks so much about the power of vulnerability, you're making yourself vulnerable. But actually what that does is inspires other people to also be safe to be vulnerable. So it also goes back to helping to create an environment in which people can be fully human. And when you can be fully human, you can be fully yourself. You can make mistakes and come up with brilliant solutions. You can be in your truth, in integrity, aligned with your values at work. And that's a really beautiful thing. So being, seeking out discomfort with curiosity and being not necessarily unafraid to be vulnerable, but just doing it anyway, is really powerful for the world around you, whether it's your immediate world, your workplace, your family, or the wider world. It reminds me of a book title. I think it was a book title, um, you know, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Yeah, it's a great book, actually. And also, yeah. The Gift of Fear. Have you heard of that one? No. So it's yes. like a, Gavin De Becker. It was an Oprah's Book Club book. And I read it when I was in my early 20s before I went traveling by myself around Europe for a few months. Yes. And it also talks about your gut instinct and like the gift yes. of fear, but knowing when fear is trying to really give you a, a useful message. So really listening to like your gut instinct, but then also mm -hmm. recognizing when fear is just kind of this metaphysical comfort zone thing. So I think it's, yes. it's useful to know the difference between the two comfort zone Absolutely. fear and primal. You really need to not get on an elevator with that person fear. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we don't have too, too much time left. I do have a couple of wrap up sort of type things, but before I get to those, is there anything that else that you would like to talk about today? I would anyway, love a lot. time for questions if people have any, to be honest. I think, I think we have covered a lot, Heather. And I'm we really have covered a lot. Okay, let me just, we have, okay, folks, um, open the chat function, please, if you don't have it open. Um, and type in your questions. We'll give you just a quick sec to do that. While people are thinking of questions and typing their questions, I will ask you, Betsy, about gratitude because that's a subject that I really love. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me something that you're feeling gratitude for, something that you're grateful for right now? Oh, gratitude is so powerful. I am so grateful that I get to sit in my home office and talk to people all over the world and connect, hopefully, with people all over the world. This is such a gift and this is the pandemic i've been working remotely for eight years and i used to have to not tell people that i didn't live where they did so that they would still hire me and i'm just so grateful that we now get to live in places we want to live and still connect with each other so yeah. that's a big one what yeah um oh geez okay well let me respond to that first i am um, uh, i lived on one side of canada my family was on the other side of uh, the country and the pandemic, speaking of silver linings, everybody using Zoom, including people who aren't really tech savvy, having that connection was amazing. Talk about a gift. And then it made moving them to the other side of the world easier. 
mm. because you know the technology was already there and we could still it's so easy to connect what am i grateful for um i'm so grateful i found you because i when i when the science summit was coming together and the ideas were flowing you were on my wish list and i was like no i need to i need to inquire about this and it took me a little bit to connect with you and um you know talk about fear sort of that you know when we think about ourselves i was like oh maybe she doesn't want to do it maybe she doesn't like me <laughs> and i am scary i am i'm so glad you I'm so glad you got into it i'm grateful so yeah once once i sort of tracked down we you know someone in common it was actually the person who had put on the webinar um, and I, I, I've been to a few webinars from um, IABC um, UK, so I reached out to that person and she made the intro, so I was grateful that I persevered a little bit and that you were so gracious as well, so thank you for that. Pleasure, it's been a pleasure, and thank you to everybody who's been here, because I'm realizing we are quickly marching toward the end, but people have stayed, I'm so grateful I that you stayed know. from all over the and world. It, it is, it is late here. So we do have one comment from Aya. Um, Aya is a social media coordinator. Um, she said, I agree. Okay, I can't remember what she was agreeing with, but she agrees with something. <laughs> um, being able to curate our own social media feeds uh, also helps us oh, reinforce our biases. This from a social media expert. Aya knows what she's talking about. But yeah, we, we yes. do. It's our comfort zone. Again, so add a few, few sources in there that make you uncomfortable listen to some podcasts by people that you're just like whoa but it's sharpening and it does keep us from forgetting it's so easy to just get in our comfort zone with social media in particular oh we've got a we've got a question we do have another okay these are wise words some of which i have learned from aging <laughs> how can we spread the word to children who would benefit from these ideas greatly oh well we all probably have contact with children in our own our own spheres. And actually my book is dedicated to my godchildren who I dedicate as they will inherit the world that we create, but also they're smarter than us. <laughs> I teach 20, 21 year olds and also like I'm around children quite regularly. And I think they know more than we do about these things. So maybe I'd flip that. I think we can, we can facilitate space for them to share with us what they know because they speak truth they haven't been programmed out of the truth of speaking the truth knowing what matters to them knowing they know what kind of world they're growing up in you know i have was with a friend's seven and five-year-old last weekend and mm -hmm. they know the news they know about climate change they know about black lives matter they know about all these things so maybe it's our job to learn from them and to benefit from how they see the world and then work on doing what we can with the power that we have as adults, maybe people in leadership positions to help create the world that they know is possible. That's, that's a wonderful, <laughs> that's a wonderful coming down from this narrative uh, end point. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that these two comments um, that we, we have a span of generations uh, with us today and that's really really uh, wonderful um i think um we should just wrap up i do have a few thank you thank yous i think we should wrap up because we are very very close to time and we can't go over um the time has flown by uh betsy it's been an absolute privilege speaking with you as i said i mean you're on my my wish list right my, right from the beginning thank you so so much for sharing your perspective your positive energy and your passion uh, with us. Um, and from both of us to all of you watching, thank you so much for spending this time uh, with us. I know time is valuable. We know time is valuable. Thank you for um, thank you for spending it with us. Uh, please connect. Um, if I can invite people, Betsy, is that okay? <laughs> please yes, connect please, with us both. Thank okay. you. Yeah, here's how you can find me. Yep, please connect with us both online. Betsy, I know is really active on Instagram. I'm really active on LinkedIn. Uh, also, there is a little ask, there's a little bit of homework here. Uh, please be sure to give us feedback through the Science Summit program. So if you go back into this session, which should be in your own schedule, um, there, um, it's a very nice little simple feedback, um, different faces with different emotions, which is nice because it transcends language, culture. Um, so it's very easy and we would appreciate it. Um, but see, I would love to provide some 
perfect summary wrap up of everything we heard today, I, but I'm still in the digesting mode. I'm still in the processing <laughs> mode and I suspect I'm not alone. Oh, excellent. Thank you for the push there. Um, your podcast is the discomfort practice. Also, Betsy, you have a very unique name. So I do know if you Google your name that you come right to the, yeah. the top. <laughs> so, so please, please find Betsy. Um, Betsy, it's been an absolute treat. Uh, getting to know you a little bit um, leading up to this a lot more today. Um, I think I speak for everyone and just saying thank you for being so generous. Um, thank you for being so generous. With us. And thank it's you really so much great. for holding space for this conversation. I really just hope that something today has landed. I hope that people feel inspired about themselves and about the world we can create together and more connected. I hope you feel more connected knowing that there are a lot of people out there seeking the same things, care about the same things, who want to connect. So thank you so much, Heather, for the invitation. And thank you to everyone who's here today. Please do get in touch. Thank you and goodbye, everyone. Bye.